Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. I'm here today with the one and only Arturo Dominguez. Who is Arturo Dominguez? Arturo Dominguez is an author, a writer, an activist, uh, known on, in, on, on Twitter as Extreme Arturo. Listen, folks, follow this guy. Go to Medium. Follow Extreme Arturo. Because I'm going to tell you, if you want to learn about what's happening in today's world, in today's America, in today's hemisphere. Listen to this guy, Arturo Dominguez. Welcome to Politics and Right. How are you doing today, sir? Man, great, great. Good to be here. Always love coming on the show. Well, man, I love having you because, I mean, every time you are here, it's a learning experience. And today we intend to keep that flow up. Recently, by the way, our hearts go out because at the time of the man. taping of this program, at this point, there are 14 dead kids killed by gun in Uvalde, Texas, and one teacher. I mean, um, it, it, it is sad that we're seeing that. I mean, what, first of all, what's your first impressions on that? Before we get into any technicalities, Arturo, what's your first impressions? You know, my first impressions, obviously, you know, go out to the families. I, I can't, I can't imagine. Not, I, I would, I don't even want to think about it, but my, my heart goes out to the families for sure. But um, my, my first impression is, you know, I've been doing a lot, been focused a lot on extremism lately since a little while, about a month before, maybe a little longer, the Buffalo attack happened. I was, you know, starting to issue warnings because of you know, seeing an increase in xenophobic rhetoric on, on the far right and, and things like that. Um, you know, what, what happened today, I don't, at the school, I don't, I don't know that, uh, you know, it's obviously some form of extremism, right, to, to, to get to that level to somebody acting that way. Um, but like, you know, at some point it all ties back because there's so much extremist stuff going on out there. Well, we may never know what this guy's motivations are because apparently he was shot and killed. So, um, you know, we know that he's, it seems like based on his name alone, uh, my assumption, it seems like a Hispanic guy, uh, 18 year old. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about was how, uh, what I've been talking about recently is, is how like Latinos and even some black people and stuff, they get hooked in by some of this nationalism stuff you know, and, 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 you know, get, I don't know, they get sucked in, you know, they, they use different tactics to, to like draw on our people. And, and sometimes it works, you know? Um, so, you know, again, like, you know, the, it, it screams extremism to me. Um, but to what extent, you know, is well, it, you know, it, is it the extremism my track? I, I kind of doubt it. You know, this, it's probably not the hate group type you know, civil war type. Maybe it was, I don't know. It's hard to the tell. The interesting thing about it is all, um, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that, uh, you know, it seems so far based on just name alone from what Greg Abbott put out there, according to what you were telling me that you saw in the news thus far, is that the name of the person seems like it would make him a Latino. We don't know for sure yet. We're speculating right, we right now. And by the time we hear this, we would probably know a few, uh, a few more details. But we, we can be general enough to say that we understand that um, even in this supremacy, this white supremacy type environment that we're living in because of what the right has been doing, that there is a certain there are a certain percentage of folks, irrespective of race, that get drawn in. 
And to put it right. bluntly, Arturo, some feel it and honor that will. I am the exception. They want me and I become right. one of their largest advocates. Your thoughts on that? Because that is what I have seen with a lot of a lot of Latinos lately. And believe it or not, many black folk as well. Yeah, you know, well, <clears throat> my take on the deal is, you know, it's in the white Latinos don't exist article. I hate to keep going back to that. No, but there, actually, it, two folks, years no, ago. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, that's an important, that is one of is the actually, premier pieces that you wrote. And I think a lot of a lot of people need to go back to that. So first of all, tell folks about that article that and, and where they well, need to read it. In that article, you know, I wrote that, what, maybe two years ago, close yeah. to it, something like that. Anyway. Uh, in that article, I was basically calling out, um, you know, Latinos that that uh, that act like white supremacists, say racist stuff, you know, all these things. And the whole point of it was based on what I see from hate groups and extremists. My lived experiences in Texas, where people's like all the time, "Oh, I thought you were white," and you know, there's reasons for that. That that. <laughs> And it's in the shooter's manifesto. Like he even says it, you know, you can be white looking, but you're not culturally white. And so since I'm walking around, you know, I'm Cuban. I, I make make it well known I'm Cuban. I'm proud Cuban. I eat Cuban food. You know, <laughs> I act Cuban like crazy. So, you know, obviously I, I don't I don't fit the white type. So like for them, they're like, oh, I thought you were white. And, you know, because I speak Spanish and stuff, all of a sudden I'm not, even though last time I checked, you know, I look pretty freaking white, right? But um, so, so yeah, when I say that white Latinos don't exist, I kind of said, in the sense, I'm saying that they can't because in American society, like, you know, even people on the street, like, oh, I thought you were white. And then you got the shooter in the manifesto about, you know, you could be culturally white, like Enrique Tario, but since he's black, he, he'll never be white. You know, he even uses a... Uh, an example of like a say a black guy that was that was born in France, you know, his family's been there many generations. Like, you know, he may be French and he may be culturally white, but he's still, you know, from the sub-Saharan Africa, whatever he put in in the manifesto. Um, so that you know, he might be culturally white, but he can't be white because you know of his skin color. So, and and that's where like the shooters manifesto is same with hate groups, same with white people in general. That's sort of where they draw the line. It's to be white. You have to be like directly of European descent. You know, even though some of us in Latin America have European, you come from European descent, that doesn't count because we're being filtered through Latin America first. So you see what I'm saying? Like we speak oh, I Spanish. Get it. I so, live it. You know, I'm from I, Panama. Yo soy Latino. Right, right. I, mean, I, I get it's it. It's weird. It's weird, man. It's really weird. But, that, that's how they hook them in. Like, you know, the Proud Boys used male chauvinism. You know, that they, they targeted black dudes with that. They targeted Latino dudes with that. That's how they got Enrique Tario, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, it's all about, you know, putting the man up, at up above the women, the women, you know? It's, it's exactly what they say it is, male chauvinism, you know? And that's how they hook a lot of our people in. And they don't realize that they're, you know, promoting, like, white supremacist ideals and stuff. Like, you know, Enrique Tario never calls it white supremacy. He calls it Western culture or Western society. But we yeah. know what he means. I mean, yeah. you know what I mean? So, like, anytime anybody talk about, like, oh, man, they're coming down on white people, this, that, and the other, you'd see Enrique Tario comment on, on Telegram. He'd say, oh, they hate us. And I'm like, bro, what do you mean us? Like, you darker <laughs> than the rest of these fools. You, like, you're not white, bro. Like, I mean, nobody <laughs> told you you were, but. <laughs> but okay, whatever. So yeah, I mean, our our people buy into that, and you get in it, you stay in it long enough, and and you start believing all that. Shit. Like Enrique Tario, excuse my French, but um, you start believing all that stuff, and and it, it puts people in a bad way. And like, I mean, they turned on on Tario. You know, they they called him the token Negro. You know, they called him all kinds of stuff. Like we're not gonna have that anymore. And I was like damn guys don't be nice about it hell like they, they were they went full-blown racist and i was like that's what you and he get. was one that's, of them right right and, and he was one of them and that's what i tell people eventually they're gonna come for you dude like why are you taking sides with with them like i i, I don't get it you know so i try to call it out you know and i know you know i track extremists and stuff i see what they're doing 
you know, and, and I like to talk about the intersection of politics and racism and stuff. So all of that kind of goes together. You know, you can't, you can't not, uh, you know, in, investigate rhetoric and dog whistles and not get into politics because that's where it's used the most, you know? So, you know, the Klan uses dog whistles, things like that. But then when you got politicians using them too, you know, we're starting to have more problems, you know, and they create bigger problems because they're, they have big platforms, you know, they, they spread that message so far and so wide. So I think that's where we are in society today. A lot of people buy into that. Now, um, in, in your piece, ethno-nationalism, did you, did you take into account that um, when we look at pe the psychology of people, uh, mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. leads them into the thought process that just maybe, you know, they're invisible, that they, they, they'll be seen differently? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like, you know, when, when we talk about allyship with white people, right, on the civil rights aspect, mm -hmm. right, you know, Black Lives Matter movement and all that stuff, you know, they, for them, that's what this is. It, it's in the opposite, you know, spectrum. Right. So, you know, they treat them as allies. They, you know, invite them over for dinner. They, you know, socialize. They, you know, make them one of them. And they, they're useful tools because, you, they, you know, the Proud Boys could sit there and say, oh, look, we're not racist. One, our chairman's an Afro-Cuban. Yeah. How can he possibly be racist? And that fool was racist as hell. So, you know, um, so yeah, like, you know, they, they become more of a tool um, to basically just send out a mixed message, to try to cover their own tracks, to try to throw people off and... You know, when when the Proud Boys are, are saying that they're, you know, here to protect Western society and these blah, blah, values, chauvinist, whatever. I'm not going to get into all that. But but, yeah, when they when they try to promote that, I mean, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about white supremacy. Colon you know, they say colonialism is the best thing that ever happened to, to the West. Like, come on, man. Like, you you know, it, it, it is interesting because uh, <laughs> I wrote a piece uh, a few uh, a few days ago, actually. And the title of the piece that I wrote was actually called My Message to Those Who Believe Challenging the Fallibility of the West is a War on the West. Right. right. I read that. I read that. And, and the idea behind that was, you know, we, we have given these guys agency of yeah. where it doesn't belong. In other words, what is the Western world, right? Who created the Western world? I mean, folks like the activists white is western world and vice versa and not realizing that the western world is a call it's really the coalition of the attainments the intellect and everything of people from all over the colonizer then colonized and imparted the colonizer colonized and took it right. took knowledge it took technology. It took all these things. If we go technology after, te you know, it, it's amazing because you'd hear things like, I've never seen a thing, somebody of whatever culture develop. And then you start looking at things and you say, well, let me see. The Chinese did gunpowder. The first right. open heart <laughs> surgery was done by a black dude in South Africa. And, yeah, the, yeah. and then you start naming all these things and you realize that no culture, no race has a monopoly on intellect, a monopoly on intelligence, a monopoly on any of these things, right? Right. right. But we let them slide. Like this, this guy went on Joe, Joe, um, Joe Scarborough, and he started to say, "Yeah, we need to examine that we did bad things, but we did some bad <laughs> things. But there are great things that we did that made this world a better place." And you know, I, uh, I haven't answered him yet, but a, a guy came on to, he left a note, I think it was, a, I think it's a black guy actually left a note trying to explain to me why capitalism and all these things, the trajectory is actually good. When I'm saying, I am sorry, the trajectory is not good. The trajectory right. is to take more power from you. We've learned how to do it antiseptically. Right. You know, so I mean, um, your thoughts on, on, on this glorification, on this false Western world that never really existed? You know, and, and I, I've actually put thought into this because, you know, if I've ever, I'm ever in a situation where, you know, I'm having a discussion with a proud boy, for example, about Western civilization, 
you know, um, you know, how do they justify the genocide of how many peoples, you know what I mean? Um, the, you know, just taking people's histories and names and cultures, you know, and, in, in the, in the, the slave trade, you know, they wiped out so many, I mean, still, we're still doing it. So, I mean, the, the colonialism expansion is still happening in Latin America. So, yes. um, so yeah, so, I mean, they're taking, you know, taking land from indigenous people, wiping out their culture. That's, you know, cultural genocide is genocide. I mean, you, you're taking away their entire histories and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to say that there's value in that, because we have paved roads, you know, like, man, the Romans had paved roads, the Egyptians had paved roads, like there was paved roads long time before, you know, quote unquote, white people. So, yeah, I mean, it's such a just, it's, it's a false, like, it, it, it's an argument that really doesn't have any merit. And, and the thing is, there's a guy in, in 2014, right? He tried to reform the KKK, tried to get people of color recruited in there, you know? And this was like in Michigan or something like that. And, um, you know, he the language that he used in 2014 is the exact same language the Proud Boys used. So, you know, he, he said that this is more about nationalism, about basically it's America first, uh, you know, things like that. Um, and again, it's, I don't know, America first is just more unfettered capitalism, basically. But yes. Um, but as far as, you know, what, like how the, these hate groups push it, 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 I mean, you see it like when they use propaganda in Cuba, right? They promote capitalism like it's, you know, infallible, right? Like there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But they never tell you about, you know, how many people living on the street here or something they don't have in Cuba. They don't tell you about the 12 million kids that are don't know where their next meal is coming from. You know, th this whole capitalism is so good and, and uh, colonialism is so good. It, it's just the it, it's it's a logical fallacy. You know what I mean? It, it kind of, the whole argument turns on itself the minute you challenge it. And, you know, I, I guess that's probably why they don't let many people challenge them. I, I am glad that you made that comment. That's why they don't make people challenge it. Because when when I'm doing my program and I'm inside of my room, we we have to listen to uh, a lot of folks on the right say things like capitalism may not as good as you want it to be, but it has taken more people out of poverty than any other system. To which I also say, and it has killed more people and put more people in poverty than any other system as well. I mean, you know, what what I try to do with a program, and I think you do a lot with your writing, is to try to open people's eyes. You know, if you look, if, 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 if it takes a mess on the outside to create a smooth running America, an America of milk and honey, while that kid in Venezuela uh, is, is, is providing what you cannot provide for the penance he gets, while that kid that is digging up diamonds in, in Zaire, while that kid that is uh, getting bauxite in, in, in Jamaica so that we can have beautiful aluminum foil that's manufactured here, you know, where the added right. value doesn't go to those who mine it. You know, I mean, right. there are all these things that capitalism actually does that Americans themselves don't see it. So it's easy for them to just say it's the best system since apple pie, right. forgetting that we invaded Haiti and controlled Haiti for 20 years, charged them charge them for their invasion right you know? for their freedom yeah i know well in the case of haiti uh france charge hey i mean <laughs> them for their free yeah. i sit down yeah. there and i am actually there's a great article i had known about it before there's a great article in the new york times called ransom there's a series out started yesterday oh okay yeah yeah i, I saw it i saw it yeah. and it is amazing i mean it's a long read and it's a multiple i've only gone through probably 20 percent of it but the, the truth of the matter is the gall of, of these people and, and the reason they get away with it is, like I tell you all the time when we're not on air, they don't read enough of your stuff, they don't read enough of my stuff, they don't read enough of right. stuff that other people are out there telling the truth, right? Saying right, these right. are how things really are. So what do you think about, you know, how do we get, how do we try to mitigate this? Well, you know, capitalism can't function without 
the exploitation of labor at some point, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it started with the enslaved and when they couldn't do that anymore, you know, they incarcerated them and they do the, you know, leasing out convict labor. But then on a colonialism level, you, you know, you, you have what, everything you just discussed, you know, yeah. you have these kids, you know, mining diamonds that are, you know, they're not reaping the reward of that final sale. You know, that, that doesn't make that kid rich. Right. You know, he finds one, he gets a little chunk of change and then he has to go find another one, you know? Yep. So, you know, in, in a lot of parts of Latin America, it's that way too. So yeah, it's, that's the biggest uh, problem with, with capitalism that I see is that uh, with unfettered capitalism, I should say, because it, it can't function without exploited labor. It has mm -hmm. to have exploited labor. You, we, we have migrants in the fields here. We have migrants in the field in Brazil. We have migrants in the field everywhere. So, yeah, and, you know, when it comes to countries like Cuba and Venezuela, it's because they can't exploit it. So, you know, they they try to make sure they fail. So, uh, you know, they tried it with Bolivia, you know. You, you just said something magical there, right? Because I try to preach that on our program. Uh, most of the people on my program, they have been taught to hate Hugo Chavez. And... I knew about Hugo Chavez for quite from its inception. I know about Hugo Chavez when he tried to create the United States of South America. I, I, I mean, I know Hugo Chavez when Hugo Chavez was trying to create a currency that many people use down there. Hugo Chavez was the banker of choice for Brazil, Argentina, and a few others when the petrodollars were running. So the problem that America has with Venezuela is one they will never tell you. And I, 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 want, I want you to po posit this. Venezuela is sitting on the largest pool of oil in the world at this point in time. They don't talk about it much. They don't talk right. about it much anymore. But they're sitting on the largest pool of oil in the world. And it is a socialist state, of which it means that the oil, unlike America, where Finder, well, well, if you're lucky enough today to buy a piece of land that has mineral rights, you can get a royalty for right. the oil company taking your oil out, but they make most of the money. You can, if, if it's on public lands, you make niet, nothing. Right. The oil companies drill and sell your oil. There used to be a thing called a depletion allowance, and there were all these technicalities yeah, that yeah. You, you used to, that these guys use, and they make a windfall on oil that should belong to who again all of us right how does it look if you have a venezuela sitting on the largest amount of oil with it belonging to the people and when it exploited you get a lot of people that i don't know if you remember in the beginnings of the, the hugo chavez days people were starting to form their own all all the people in, in in venezuela had their little shops on the road and all that kind of yeah stuff. yeah you know and, and then you know go ahead go ahead Oh, oh no! Geez. And then came then came the U.S. and the sanctions and the cut them off from the world markets and you know all that stuff. So you know you you can't. My my thing with the U.S. foreign policy in Latin America, especially, you can't declare Cuba a failed state when you've been you know had your boot on their neck for sixty years. Right. You know you want to declare it a failed state, let it fail. Like lift all the sanctions. I dare you to lift all the sanctions and let it fail. And I promise you it won't. And that's what scares them. That's what scares them. A socialist exactly. paradise 90 miles away is going to scare the daylights out of them. And, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, that's the kind of government I want. But, um, you know, you can have, a, a, you know, capitalist driven socialist type economy um, very easily. You know, I don't I don't see why we pay taxpayers. This is where it gets me, because this is like Biden's infrastructure bill. It's a big giveaway to corporations and stuff. Right. It's going to privatize all our roads. They're going to put tolls all over our roads. So like now, you know, we just, you know, unleashed trillion whatever dollars to, to, for infrastructure. So we're paying for that. And then we're going to have to pay to use it. Thank you. And that, right. And that, that's the, the privatization that's unfettered capitalism. That's, that's, ex, that's wealth extraction from from the population to, to the you know i mean come, that that's colonialist behavior you know like that's dictator type stuff where they just suck you dry piece by piece and send that money up and it's it's ridiculous because you know how it is here in houston 
they built the belt the beltway the san houston tollway and oh after so many years of tolls it's going to pay for itself and then it'll be free well now the county is dependent on that money mm -hmm. and it'll never be free so we're going to forever pay for that and pay to use it so it's and, and you know it disproportionately impacts poor people too these toll roads are for people who can afford it you know mm -hmm. poor people where are they stuck they're stuck on the feeder roads and on surface streets where all the smog is and all the pollution is so you know it, it opens up the door to this environmental racism and things so like it, it's it's a huge ripple effect that goes you know black on it goes you know down on us and then all the money goes to the top so it's a rigged system, you know, like we built the internet infrastructure, right? And we have to pay to use it. We have to pay access fees. We have to pay a third party to get us a cell phone and provide us access to, you know, their towers. They all lease the same towers from each other. So like nobody has a bigger map, you know, everybody's the same mm -hmm. stuff. So it's like, you know, and it's all oligopolies is what they call them, you know, because since it's not a monopoly, you have three companies running every mm -hmm. industry. They can fix prices. They can do, you know, all that stuff. And, and all it does is prey on the poor disproportionately more than, and, than everyone else. You know, and, and that is a word that we have to get out because the truth of the matter is these people have great, they have the fund, they control the media, they have the funds to fund the media and, right. uh, and, and be able to tell the story that they want to tell. Now, we'll be right back with Arturo Dominguez. Politics done right depends on you to keep doing what we do. What do we do? We make sure to keep, number one, the internet seeded with blogs and information to counter the right and to present what progressives represent for the be benefit of us all to everybody so that it's not misread, misled by any other entity. We make sure and populate that internet with blogs, with videos, with all these other things to make sure that we are informed and to counter everything that you normally hear that, that are lying at the right. We also make sure to create articles in, in magazines, articles in newspapers all around the country to ensure again that our message gets out there. Last but not least, we also write books. As you see it, Class Warfare, The Only re Resort to Right-Wing Doom, How to Make America Utopia, are two of the many books that I've written on these issues. So please support us in one of many ways. Numero uno, you can support us at PayPal, either one time or monthly. Go to politicsdoneright.com slash PayPal. You can support us on Patreon. That is politicsdoneright.com slash Patreon. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You can support us by becoming a part of our YouTube channel, going to politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube, or you can support us in many other forms that you can find at politicsdoneright.com slash support. Be sure to visit our store, politicsdoneright.com slash store, and get our books at politicsdoneright.com slash books. Here's Arturo again. Now we have to try harder in the way that we tell the story because when America, you know, I, I always, I always said that one of my biggest fears is when those who continue to vote against their interests realize that they've been had, and unfortunately, they are armed. Yeah, and you know, it, it's it's tricky because. They're, the people that are voting against their interest are voting based on, you know, uh, biases, racism, mm -hmm. by their, they're basing it on, you know, oh, we're being invaded at the southern border, which, you know, clearly we're not because it's not an armed battalion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, come on now. Nobody's, there's no invasion. Okay. So, um, yeah, you know, that, that land, that's what people on the right, that, that's what it is now, you know? I said that uh, in that ethno nationalism is the new conservatism for Latino rebels. Um, that that's what it is, you know. Conservatism, conservatism nowadays is really based, and and I'm not saying every conservative is like this, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> the platform, the politicians, the rhetoric, the just nonsense. Every time I hear some political ad and I hear the left or something in the ad, I just laugh. I'm like, Jesus Christ, people buy this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard my brother do the let's go Brandon thing or something.
when, like when he, he was here a couple of weeks ago, I was like, really? Like you fell for that? Like, I mean, who cares you, about did, Were you able to talk to him or you weren't able yeah, to? Yeah, you know, we, we talked a little bit, but he really didn't want to talk much. So um, I'm guessing he probably just didn't want to be challenged, but right. they're, they're supposed to be coming over. I'm probably going to see him again soon. So, you know, but it'll... We all have our right wing relatives. I have one sister yeah. that is actually a right winger, and I, I always, you know, when when she comes takes us, I always say, you know, I would like to leave you invite her at night, you know. <laughs> no way, dude. Leave you invite her no. takes us at night, you know. No way. And, and, and see what how how people feel about you out there, you know. Yeah, that's scary. That's yeah, I, I, you know, I even even for what's his name uh, with the Proud Boys, what's his name? Tuar, uh, uh Tario, Enrique Tario. 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 Put Tario mm -hmm. in, in in Vider Texas at night alone. Man, yeah, you know? that that changes mine. That would change his mind oh, yeah. real quick. I, I think real I'll put, quick. Put, what what's her name? Uh, the the girl Candace that Owens. Got, uh, Candace Owens. Put them there, you know. <laughs> put them there, and I tell you better than that. Let her go over. Uh, go in. Go go to Vider, Texas, and hug her her very nice husband and, yeah, and, and, I, and see what happens, you know? Man, yeah, I, that, that would change their mind. You know, drop them off anywhere, basically, in East Texas. Like, you yeah. know, that's not a city. <laughs> that's not a city. I mean, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of places all in the, in the Piney Woods over there. And oh, it's, yeah. It's kind of creepy. It's creepy. I used to ride in the Piney Woods. I made sure there were four white guys around me when I ride mm -hmm. my, when I cycle. And they knew it. They, 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 we, we had fun with it. We had fun with We're like, Berto, you know, you got to keep up with us now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's Don't funny. let us have to leave you out here, Egberto. <laughs> <laughs> so you get, hey, I bet the adrenaline will start flowing then, brother. Yeah, you know, right. You're, you're my white brothers. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Because, yeah, but, yeah. but no, but, but serious, you know, we look, I... I, I th look, we are going to change this, but right now, the, you know, that stuff, three steps ahead, two steps back, three steps ahead, one step back. I mean, we, we're, we backslide some, we go up, and right now we're in that backsliding thing, and the thing about it is if we don't arrest it soon, we have to be careful that the backslide doesn't go back to previous territory. You know? Yeah, you know, that's, that's one of the things that worries me, um, you know, especially, particularly with you know, extremist language coming from politicians like, you know, Ali said in, in a talk recently that black men are killed by police more frequently than they were lynched from back in the day. You know, who said that? Lynching. Ali, Allison. Oh, wow. And, I didn't know that. And, you know, and, and it's true. And, you know, that that shocks me because. Mm -hmm. What one, what qualifies as a lynching, right? I wrote an article, What Defines a Lynching, a while back. Um, and, you know, I always reference uh, Ibram X. Kendi's article in uh, The Atlantic from 2019 called The Lynch Mob of One. Mm -hmm. And in that article, he talks about exactly what happened in Buffalo. You had mm -hmm. a guy with a high-powered rifle, could fire rounds at a rapid rate, um, killing Black people. And he's essentially a lynch mob of one. And right. the only thing he needs is that the only thing he needs is that one weapon. Um, to me, and I dare not throw that word out there too, you know, loosely because of what happened. And out of respect for the families, I try to be careful about what I say. But there's right. a lot of things we really, really have to address. And this, I think, is one of them. In the anti-lynching bill. Is there a provision in there that says that what happened in Buffalo qualifies as a lynch? Because he went to hunt black right. people. Right. Yes. That was his motivation. Wasn't a damn toothache. It was he went to hunt black people. He drove right. four hours, whatever, to I mean, there was some serious intent there. So that's a lynching, man. That is a lynching. And and I've I've felt that way about Dylan Roof. You know, had there been a lynching bill, would he would he have been 
charge for lynching mm-hmm. or is lynching only defined as what it once what it used to be with the string yeah, what, with it, rope. yeah what, what people commonly think like you know emmett till was lynched he wasn't hung from a tree right right so right why, why does why does that we don't need a pre-qualifier we need the motivation the motivation exactly. was for for the buffalo shooter the buffalo terrorist the motivation was to kill black people in mass that to me qualifies as as a lynching crime as it's definitely a hate crime obviously but uh whatever is in the anti-lynching bill which i haven't really had a chance to read is you know i have my opinions on that too but um i don't know if this if if that qualifies you know under that kind of language but it should it, it should qualify. Should. I mean, technically speaking, it, it should qualify because I mean, yeah. and actually it's, it's, it's pretty much, it's worse, right? One is, you know, because you can do it so fast. And so, he, right, right. I mean, this guy, you know, you, you can't say it was economic anxiety that drove him to do this or, you know, the suggestion of the toothache that went viral on Twitter the other day. You can't make that argument when the guy had $5,000 worth of gear in his car. And a manifesto. He, right. And a manifesto. And he came from a, you know, relatively wealthy neighborhood, you know, from what I understand. And and it, it wasn't, you can't claim economic anxiety. I mean, come on, man. The the motivation there was clear. The manifesto is pretty freaking clear. And if he got away, he was going to shoot up a school. That's what scares me was, you know, if he got away, he was going to shoot up a school. Now this dude shoots up a school. Yeah, he finished if there's, job, if there's right? A, yeah, right. If there's a connection there, I'm gonna shit myself. Oh, no, sorry I for cuss, cussing. No, no, but no, but, no. but yeah, no. If there's a connection there, that's gonna be very uh, uh, alarming. I think, and, and it should be could be a shock to the system if the country doesn't see it already. Um, I, I'm I'm amazed that only eight days after after the Buffalo shooting, we're not even talking about extremism anymore. You, you know, it, it, well, you wrote an article on that. Um, you wrote an article titled um, uh, Days After a Racist Terrorist Attack, Society is Ready to Move On. Tell us yeah. a little bit about that, because, I mean, I well, think Americans need to see how this stuff is getting too normalized right now. Yeah, and that's the problem. That's the problem. And uh, it's normalized to the point where, you know, a shooting happened. Everybody's shocked. But that shock wears off a little bit faster every time. And I want then, to read something. I want to read something from your piece because this this is touching. This is this important. Okay. You say this is from Arturo uh, Dominguez article titled "Day After Racist Terrorist Attack Society Is Ready to Move On." He did it. Actually, it was written today, and he said the following. Uh, uh, I've had it here, the piece that I had highlighted that I wanted to cover. Bear with me one second, because it was prescient. Um, we should not applaud. Uh, let's see. Bear with me. Bear with me, folks. It's a good one. It's a good one. It's a good one. It's a good one. Anyhow, keep to- let's let's keep talking as I find a piece that I that I want. So so yeah, you know, it, it basically, you know, I'm trying to keep the conversation out there. I, I really really am. Um, I'm in a position where, you know, I have knowledge, you know, and experience here a little over a decade of of actively tracking extremists and and the beginning of the alt-right to where we are now and and watching the evolution of it. Um, And I I think that people aren't taking things like the manifesto seriously enough. And that's where this comes in. And that's where this comes in, where you say, here is what Arturo your stru- you say on this article, lone star, lone wolves are a myth. White men are radicalized by the words of and deeds of those that came before them. They associate with specific crowds and discuss extremist ideas and express their hate for non-white people. They then spread their fundamentalist ideas to the general public via social media channels that allow them to operate unabated inciting one another to commit hateful acts against non-white communities, whether verbal, physical, or outright murder. To use language that was used against Muslim, their terrorist cells. And I love how you associate that. These are terrorist cells, and we treat them as such. They absolutely are. 
um, you know, uh, you, you're not going to convince me the Buffalo shooters are lone wolf. You're not going to convince me any of these shooters are lone wolves. They're being radicalized somewhere. They have connections somewhere. Um, this, this school shooter today has a connection somewhere. Somebody helped radicalize this guy. He, it didn't happen by itself, you know? So somebody started opening the doors and opening their eyes. So if it was, and I hate to say, I hate to bring up Tucker Carlson because I feel like talking about Tucker Carlson and, and Fox news is sort of sweeping the issue under the rug because it's so much deeper than that. But if this guy saw Tucker Carlson talk about the great replacement theory, for example, I'm not saying it's associated with that, but let's say, let's say the Buffalo shooter, the great replacement theory, say he got his information from Tucker Carlson, even though he didn't say he got it from that. Then he goes online and there's troves of information that seemingly validate what Tucker Carlson says. It's all bull, but some of them look like actual studies. You know, you, you got the center for immigration studies that, you know, Southern poverty law center says, are a hate group. And I concur. They're a freaking hate group. They're part of the John Tanton network or whatever they, however you say that guy's name. You know, that guy was a big believer in the great replacement theory and things like that and wanted to, you know, lock down the country from immigration and stuff. So they produce studies that, that flat out lie, you know, and, but they validate things that, that Tucker Carlson says. So I think it, it's, uh, it's a big issue um, that that people are just not discussing, and you have to look deeper than what it is. And if people were to, if some people read the manifesto, they'd be shocked because I assure you, that's what the conservative family members sound like. Maybe you know what, not I, I didn't read it yet. Um, did you read the whole manifesto? What is it? Yeah, yeah 168 pages. 180. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, as far as readable content, because there's a lot of pages that are just memes that are full of memes okay uh anti-semitic stuff a lot of a lot of that but um uh, you know if you read through the thing it might take you a little while it's probably i would say probably more like 110 or 120 pages worth of reading but uh yeah i read it a couple times you know and i've been searching through it every time i think of a key phrase i want to you know reference see if he mentions it what his views are about it and try to, um, you know, cross-reference that with some of the stuff we're seeing on on hate group channels, you know, things and trying to see if these, uh, I try to draw a connection um, to where these ideas start, how they, how these people get radicalized, young white men get radicalized. Um, it starts very basic, you know, and, and, it, and it grows. And if you, I don't recommend looking at the memes. They're just really hateful and, and right. you know, but you see the progression in the memes where they go from something seemingly benign to something just outright horrible, you know? So yeah, it's a gradual progression, you know, how, how these guys get drawn in. And, and I think it's an issue that the country's not taking seriously enough. Mm -hmm. um, we, it's an issue that we can't rely on the federal government, the department of justice, the FBI, we can't rely on them because they're, they're, they can't do anything until an actual criminal act is, right. you know, occurs. And unfortunately, for the for, you know, two in, in 10 days resulted in 24 people dead. So it, it's, you know, the best way to confront the issue is by addressing the people in our proximity. You know, I have a brother. I confront him. I make sure, you know, like he ain't going to be the next mass shooter. What bothers me is that he's on the internet and maybe he convinces the next mass shooter. Maybe right. he sends the next one down the rabbit hole. You know, maybe you're that, that uncle at Christmas that you want to avoid. Maybe he's on the internet. He might right. be the one that triggers the next shooter. Um, Cause you know, when you're gone, when they go home, they're, they're back online talking their, their stuff. So, you know, when I see people that are like somewhat influential, like I went after that uh, radio DJ, couple of years ago am radio talk show guy wannabe rush limbaugh he was saying some pretty derogatory stuff about latinos and i called him on it you know wrote an article about him i trolled him for days <laughs> and the 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 point was to let him know that you know that i'm out here that i i can chase you down i can bother you i can listen to your show 
I can tweet about it in real time. I can, you know, really mess with his head. And he started blocking me everywhere, but I still kept doing it because I knew that the radio station could still see. Right. And he could, he controlled their social media. So I was tagging the radio station and that, you know, he's not allowed to block people on that page. So, you know, the point is to let them know that it's unacceptable and that there are people out here that aren't going to let it happen. And somebody like me who has, you know, who, who's been allowed to participate, but Julio, you know, gave me space on, on Latino Rebels to be able to use that platform and put him on blast. You know, I'm, I'm going to use that, you know, so some people like it, some people hate it, but it is what it is. You just can't let that stuff, you know, go on. So, you know, I, I, I've, I've done the same thing with the AM radio DJs in Miami. You know, they spread a lot of misinformation. And you go, they, you, they broadcast live, right, on right. on Facebook. And I'll get on there and I start posting comments and it pops up on the screen. So everybody who's watching <laughs> it via social media, you can see my comment. I don't say anything offensive. Or I, just, I challenge them. You just tell the truth. Right. I just, I, I don't need, I challenged them and, and they started to know who I am. And then I wrote an article about them and Latino rebels. And I think it was Hector who put the picture of the lady, the one lady, uh, you know, Scott, that, that I was messing with on Facebook. He put uh -huh. her picture of the article. I was like, Oh man, she's going to be real mad now. <laughs> and, uh, so I listened to her show waiting for her to blast me and stuff, but she didn't. So I was like, but uh, I was you know what she did stuff. know she did know that she if did. she gave you notoriety people would start listening to you and say yeah. I wonder what is Arturo saying is it right you know and that's the thing like I said with the Proud Boys the minute you chat they don't want to be challenged my mm -hmm. brother don't want to be challenged Ninoska don't want to be challenged none of them want to be challenged and you know they'll try to ignore you as much as possible yes. so until you go away until you go away so yeah, I mean, we have to, we have to be more active as a society in general. Like I, I always say that this extremism issue is is largely a white people issue because most shooters are white, and most of these extremists, you know, people yelling at Mexicans speak English or threatening, you know, black people or this and that. Even if it's just verbal harassment, you know, these things have to be we have to take it seriously because it 75% of the attacks on Asian people are from white men. But yes. if you look online, the narrative is, Oh, black people are attacking Asians and they're trying to use these things as, you know, in an anti-black effort. Yeah. And, right. And the reality is 75% of the attacks are by white men. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, white people, I, I say that all the time, but it's, it's steadily, when I start talking about ethno-nationalism, it's because it's starting to become a black people issue, a Latino issue, because these guys are starting to embrace that male chauvinist that, you know, there, there is some appeal to the America first, you know, want to take care of your country first. You know, they, they play that angle hard. And it's hard. A, but Arturo, it's also as, as a, as a, as a black man, as a Latino, as a Caribbean man, uh, who you know the struggles that you have to go through. When one of these groups want to start to put you, uh, Tario, just think about him. He feels like he's in a position of power, something that he could not attain in anyone likely of his own groups, but there because he's special. That's a good point. You see what I'm saying? That's and there's point. something about even even when we look at Candace Owens and those folks, they like being the minority of minorities because they feel special. It's not that they they feel like there's something about them that's different. I, I remember and I tell this and, and if, after this, I'll ask you to tell us a little bit about how folks can read it about all the great stuff that you're out there writing. But I just want to tell a quick story. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm black. I'm Latino. I have an accent, mm -hmm. all that good stuff. And I remember Many a times I would go to different places and, you know, unless I open my mouth or speak Spanish, everybody looks at me at just a, like just a, an African-American right. brother. Right. And um, I remember a, a white guy saying, oh, you're different. And, you know, they, they were trying to make it. Yeah. Give me that impression <laughs> of being oh, I'm different. So, you know, I can be sort of in the club. I mean, and, you know, deep inside, I know what was going on because I know a lot of brothers, African-American or otherwise, that 
take that in as like, I'm getting that special treatment. I'm special. For me, it was an insult, right? Yeah. And right. I took it as such. And I told him straight up, I'm like, when you see me, that African-American brother you see there, you see me. That Afro-Latino you see from Cuba right. or, from, or from the Dominican Republic or from Costa Rica, Honduras, or Guatemala, you're seeing me. Right. Okay? So don't, don't think there's something, there's nothing special about me. I just happen to land on a different shore. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. You see what I'm saying? That's all. I just happen to, lit, to drop on a different shore. But other than, if you don't like that folk, there's something about me you can't like either. Right. You see what I'm saying? So I, and I, and I try to, the, the thing about it is, it's not only white people you have to convince about that, it's black Americans you have to convince about that as well, because they know the dynamics that white supremacists try to place in between, let's say, the, the, the born African, the, the Latino, Afro-Latino, the, the, the black, the African American, and the truth of the matter is, it always seems like the African American get the short end of the stick. Right. You know. But Absolutely. anyhow, Arturo Dominguez, please, uh, please take some time. I want folks to, I first of all, let me just tell you, I love your writing. You, you do not hold back. You are frank. You are honest, and I think you are one that everybody should be reading. Sometimes you're going to get people upset. Yeah. But if you're not doing that, you're not making people think. And I right. think you make people think. So tell us all about the different ways people can get to your writings, to your literature. Well, I mean, you know, use Extreme Arturo. You could pretty much find me anywhere. Um, um, that's it's Extreme Arturo on Substack, on Medium, uh, Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, I'm all over there um, trying to get the Substack thing going. So, you know, to appreciate some follows over there because I know a lot of people are on Substack these days, um, you know, trying to promote, just trying to promote work, man, trying to get stuff done, hopefully get some paying subscribers. So folks, please, <laughs> if you look up Extreme Arturo and go to his Substack, and if you have the wherewithal, you know, become a paid subscriber. Likewise, do the same on Medium. Uh, if you are, if you go to Medium and find Extreme Arturo, you can also get a membership, and that don't only give you access to Arturo's work; it gives you access to my work and all of us who publish at Substack and, and the other places. But please, we need um, we need to support uh, journalists and writers that are not pushing the line of the mainstream. It is so important for us to do that. It is important for us to have many, to hear the different voices that are out there so that we can actually know what's going on. So um, please uh, look out for Extreme Arturo and do all you can to support the man's writing. Arturo Dominguez, as usual, <laughs> it's been my pleasure to have you on Politics Done Right, sir. Pleasure as well, as always. Love being here. Thanks, man. Thank you, brother. America is purported to be a democracy. That's what we all love to say and we preach it. Yet most Americans want some sort of gun control, some sort of background check, and all these different things that would save lives. But because we have a country in which it's not really a democracy, where the Republicans can actually, in their minority status for decades, control the agenda with obstructionism and, 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 and much other very very undemocratic things, that's what we get. Well, you know what's interesting? Here we continuously have these mass killings, and we just seem to be able to do absolutely nothing about it. And if you want to see why, I want to see, I want you to listen to how Mitch McConnell catered the debate, how Mitch McConnell said, this is what we are working on to solve the problems, and then check out how it's done in Australia, how it is done in Canada. They've had issues and you know what's amazing? How it's done in California, right here in the United States of America. Check this out, then we'll take it on the other side. Senator McConnell, any, any comments on the, uh, on the, on the gun control issue going on right now? You, you had said possibly that uh, you were open to Yeah, what to we're something. doing, it, we have a, a group led by Senator Cornyn 
and uh, Senator Murphy on the Democratic side, discussing how we might be able to come together to target the problem, which is mental illness and school safety. We'll get back at it next week and hope to have some results. Yeah, you know, you'll note he said uh, mental illness and school safety, nothing about gun control. But that is Senator Mitch McConnell last hour in Kentucky. He is someone President Biden just called a rational Republican. And while Biden hopes for a rational response from Congress, his counterpart to the north is proposing new gun laws. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau introducing legislation to impose a national freeze on handgun sales in response to a spike in homicides in his country. We recognize that the vast majority of gun owners use them safely and in accordance with the law. But other than using firearms for sport shooting and hunting, there is no reason anyone in Canada should need guns in their everyday lives. And Canadians certainly don't need assault-style weapons that were designed to kill the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time. That announcement by Trudeau comes two years after the deadliest mass shooting in Canadian history, when police say a gunman in Nova Scotia killed 22 people with a gun purchased here in the U.S., in Maine. Canada almost immediately banned assault weapons. Meanwhile, President Biden just wrapped up a meeting today with the Prime Minister of New Zealand. New Zealand passed stricter gun laws three years ago in the wake of a mass shooting at a mosque there less than a month earlier. And while we continue to see other countries quickly pass stricter gun laws, we're also seeing individual states here in the U.S. address the country's gun violence epidemic. As the L.A. Times reports, gun deaths dropped in California as they rose in Texas gun control seems to work. It says, quote, California's rate of gun deaths has declined by 10 percent since 2005, even as the national rate has climbed in recent years. And Texas and Florida, their rates of gun deaths have climbed 28 percent and 37 percent, respectively. We so therefore, if you have any doubt, any doubt whatsoever, what we actually are looking at. We have countries that are behaving like adults, and then we have the United States who is governed by a Republican party who represents a clear and present danger to us all. We have to ask the question, is that what we really want? Is that who we really are? Folks, let's get busy and get the bombs out. You can listen and or watch Politics Done Right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right or on YouTube Live at politics done right dot com slash YouTube. Please do not forget to follow me on Twitter for updates. My Twitter handle is at Egberto Willies. Politics Done Right depends on you to keep doing what we do. What do we do? We make sure to keep, number one, the internet seated with blogs and information to counter the right and to present what progressives represent for the benefit of us all to everybody so that it's not misread, misled by any other entity. We make sure and populate that internet with blogs, with videos, with all these other things to make sure that we are informed and to counter everything that you normally hear that, that are lying at the right. We also make sure to create articles in, in magazines, articles in newspapers all around the country to ensure, again, that our message gets out there. Last but not least, we also write books. As you see it, Class Warfare, the only re resort to right-wing doom, How to Make America Utopia, are two of the many books that I've written on these issues. So please support us in one of many ways. Numero uno, you can support us at PayPal, either one time or monthly. Go to politicsdoneright.com slash PayPal. You can support us on Patreon. That is politicsdoneright.com slash Patreon. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You can support us by becoming a part of our YouTube channel, going to politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube, or you can support us in many other forms that you can find at politicsdoneright.com slash support. Be sure to visit our store, politicsdoneright.com slash store, and get our books at politicsdoneright.com slash 
books. Well, folks, that's it for today. You know how I'm going to end this baby. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this baby. I am what? Out!